Writer's Dream. This is a show where authors could talk about how they write their books, how they publish them, and how they market them. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, just search The Writer's Dream. You can also find us on YouTube. Look for my channel, Linda Maria Frank, and just click on my picture and then click on the videos and the shows will come up. We have about 150 authors who we have interviewed and if you are a reader or a writer you can find some very good tips about writing and some very good books to read. Uh, today's show is dedicated to Vietnam veterans who write and we have three Vietnam veterans with us who uh, have written books about their experiences. We have Ron Scott who has written a, a novel called Face of the Enemy. Uh, we have Jim Smith with us, who is actually today a finalist in the Military Writers Society of America 2018 contest. He's waiting to see whether he is going to win gold, silver, or bronze for his book, which is called Heroes to the End. And he has written about his journalist uh, activities at the end of the war. We also have with us someone who is uh, a person who has a show here at uh, the... At, uh, LTV, and that is Joe Giannini, who has a show called Gung Ho, and he talks about uh, veterans' issues. So I'm going to take a little bit of a liberty today and use a salutation that uh, Vietnam veterans use with each other and say, welcome home. Our host today is Jack Bolello. Jack Bolello has written a book about a father and son, the son who was in the Vietnam War, and the name of the book is Bonds of War. So gentlemen, proceed. Have a wonderful interview. Thank you, Linda. And, you know, I've been on The Writer's Dream a number of times, both as a guest and as someone who's done interviews of guests on The Writer's Dream. But today is a singular honor for me, perhaps my, my most heartfelt appearance on, on The Writer's Dream, because I am meeting with three warriors, men who have been there where and when it counted at the times of greatest peril. So I want to welcome both Ron, Jim, and Joe. My honor. Now, each of you have written as Linda had pointed out, a book, and, but there were different kinds of books. Ron, you've written two novels. Jim, you have written dispatches or you know, what your experiences, over 350 of them were in, in many cases. And Joe, you have written a memoir of your experiences. So <clears throat> what I would like to know, I, I want to start with a quote from our supreme commander in Europe in World War II, Eisenhower, who said, I hate war as only a soldier can hate war. It's brutality, it's futility, it's stupidity. And that, you know, that, I've pondered that as a, as a student of history and as a writer. And can you gentlemen come away with that same kind of feeling and conclusion about, about that? Yes, I could say now, in retrospect, um, having joined Veterans for Peace and uh, having worship with the Quakers, that I disavow war. Mm -hmm. However, when I was there, it was the biggest adrenaline rush of my entire life. Good. Joe? Same thing with me. Um, I think it happens to a lot of young men. Uh, war. At first, before you get there, you think it's gonna, going to be an adventure. It's going to be a test of your character. And uh, once you get there and you're there for a little while, you realize how bad it is. But there's nothing you can do about it. You have to stay. But then as you get older, you realize what a horror it really is that um, people, young men and women, keep going off to war the same, the same way we did. And we have never been able to stop it. Mm. I particularly, um, I, I, uh, it's retrospect, in retrospect, that's funny. Um, there's not a day that goes by that I don't relive my time in, in, in Vietnam. And 
and uh, those, the circumstance of uh, that transition of life. Um, a transition that, at least uh, in my situation, was not asked for because I was a draftee and I was plucked out of a quality of life and thrown into a very strange, unprepared situation. And I actually became part of a, another family of, uh, I call it, young, we, we were all young men at the time. And I, I experienced a diversity of uh, opinion at that time. We had soldiers that, uh, depending on what part of the country you came from, we had soldiers that uh, were enlistees. They they were looking, actually looking uh, to the war at the war as an adventure, and we had uh, soldiers such as myself, who was the last set, the last place I ever wanted to be. <laughs> okay, we wound up being, and how you say, thrown into a, in the same family, and we very quickly learned that our mission was to survive. So, um, no, there's nothing glorious about war, mm -hmm. and there's certainly nothing glorious about seeing friends of yours no longer uh, with us. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the great philosopher Erasmus once said that war is only sweet to those who've never experienced it. And I think the, both of you three gentlemen have kind of verif verified that. And you can start a war as you please, but you can never end a war yes. as you please. And that is a lesson of history time and time again in Vietnam, I think is a prime, a prime example of that statement. So we have Joe, you enlisted. Right. You enlisted under very interesting circumstances because you could have been drafted, but you wanted to enlist for three years rather than in two. Why, why did you do well, that? Well, I wanted to Jim? be trained in uh, an MOS, a military occupational specialty that uh, would land me in the rear, and that was clerk typist. And I actually spent five months in Cameron Bay doing morning reports and processing people in and out. And I learned enough to type up my own orders when I saw an ad in the Stars and Stripes for a reporter job. And I got the job, and I spent the last seven months as a correspondent. But you had been hired by Newsday right. prior to your going to yes. Vietnam. I uh, spent four years at Newsday covering uh, high school sports and was uh, hired full-time during my junior year. So I was a member of the union. and promised a job when I uh, got out of the Army, and uh, so I wanted to preserve my life and limb so I could come home and be a sports reporter. Which you did for 40, some 40 years, I guess, right? Yes, 48 yeah. years as a reporter and editor. And Joe, you I was enlisted. I, was, I had just graduated college, actually, uh, in January of 66. I already had a draft notice, and I was uh, that generation that believed that you know serving your country was the right thing to do. And my dad was a World War II vet and very patriotic. So um, at first I was going to be drafted into the army, but just by chance these Marines walked into the room and they were looking for volunteers, and they were really impressive looking in dress blues. And so I enlisted into the Marine Corps, okay. and uh, it changed my life. And uh, you know, there are things that you read and see in your life's experience, my life's experience, and I have a golden opportunity to speak to you, gentlemen. Get it from the horse's mouth, rather than from me, which is the other end of the horse. So this is a great, a great f a feeling for me. So what I wanted to ask you, you know, when Shakespeare and Henry V said. Uh, from this day to the ending of the world, we and it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he who sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Is that a, a, an accurate concept of war? Were you a band of brothers? Do you still think of yourself as a band of brothers for those who you suffered with, bled with? In many cases, as Ron just pointed out, 
many who, for whom there was never to be a homecoming. And is that something that you have carried with you, this concept of a band of brothers? Yes, and I got to feel like every unit I wrote about was my unit. And uh, these guys took me in, they fed me, they drove me in jeeps, they allowed me to fly in helicopters uh, to far-flung outposts to write stories. And, uh, you know, if they dropped me in the field for a medevac, uh, and uh, they would always come to pick me up. Uh, and, uh, you know, then uh, I slept with them, I played cards with them, uh, smoked and drank with them, and they were my brothers. Joe? Um, same thing with me, 24-7. Um, platoon leader, and uh, my platoon consisted mostly of uh, blacks, Hispanics, and poor whites, and I was with them all the time. And at night, most of the time, it was lights out, and that meant nothing. And so when it got dark, uh, we'd talk to one another. We got very close. Uh, I wrote a story about uh, one of my platoons how close we were. I said that we loved each other, we loved each other to death. And that's how it was. We knew that if anything happened, who's ever on my left and right, they're gonna, they're gonna stay there. And if you get hit, they're gonna pull you out. So that's the way it was. And later on, I actually reunited um, with some of the people I was in Vietnam with, and we were very tight, I mean really tight. Ron? Oh boy, it's like um, one of the strangest things. Uh, my wife, my wife actually uh, intercedes many times. She gets a bit uncomfortable when two Vietnam vets <laughs> enter the room together. <laughs> and and uh, it could be two strangers, in other words, and that in the course of conversation, they discover that they're both Vietnam vets. She knows that the rest of the evening, Mm -hmm. It's lost to her, <laughs> okay, <laughs> because the two, you put two Vietnam vets together and they'll talk forever and they'll bring, and the memories will come back and flow. And, but if, if you have a situation where that isn't the case, usually Vietnam vets will, will not talk at all, particularly about their experiences mm -hmm. in, in combat, you know. And I can actually identify that in terms of my, my father, my uncle, who were uh, vets in World War II, was the same type of situation. Um, they, did, they spoke very little, particularly if they were in combat. They spoke very little, uh, unless they were the, you had two mm -hmm. veterans together, okay? And uh, to me, uh, the, 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 Viet, the, the life in Vietnam uh, and, and in my book, I emphasize uh, the human condition. And, uh, and uh, that's because a, a lot of the, the context in my, in my book is twofold. It's a story of uh, a friendship, on a very unlikely friendship that, that resulted from the draft, two individuals who never would have met if it wasn't for the draft, from opposite sides of the tracks and they wind up becoming lifesavers to each other mm. throughout the war. And uh, here you have the introduction of the human condition about how they exist and support each other and, you know, as they, you go from one assignment to another. Brothers. Brothers, right. And Ron, I have to warn you, I know your wife, Brandy, she's a force to be reckoned with, so be careful when, when you're at an engagement, when she's there and you get, and you get involved in the discussion. Well, that, that's what I need another brother. <laughs> I want to say something about Ron. Uh, Ron was one of the few, very few, college graduates in an infantry platoon. That's very unusual. Mm -hmm. That would also lead me to believe he was probably the oldest one in the platoon especially during training. Am I right about that? Very much so. <laughs> Very much so. Um, 
<laughs> Sweaty now to think about it at my current age. But at that time, I was uh, drafted at 23, and I became 24 during that first year. And in a very short order, um, I looked around me, and I was like the old guy. We had got kids coming in, with repl replacements, yeah. who were 19, 18, and, and, uh, in that category. And I found myself almost being in a situation of what you call like a father position mm. because I attracted a lot of flies. That's what I called it, a lot of flies. A lot of these youngsters would look at me and, uh, it, again, they would, they would look at me and assume that, that I was the uh, real veteran, even though I hadn't been there that much longer, you know, that type of situation. But, yes, that was the situation. Jim, you made a point in, in your book that, you were uh, 23, and you felt like a kid again. <laughs> well, my response was, Jim, you were a kid. <laughs> yes. Because all wars ultimately are children's wars. Well, uh, the thing was, you know, I had covered a Ranger playoff game. I had done stories at Giants football games and Yankees. Um, I did not feel awed by talking to a general because I had spoken to head coaches and written on the big stage. As, as a young man, and uh, that probably got me into trouble. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I had to flee several times from places where people were saying, who's that guy with the long hair? Why isn't he carrying a weapon? You know, was he the guy that said something disrespectful? And so they, they reassigned me somewhere else, and, you know, I was running out of places that I could be reassigned to by the end of my tour. And Joe, you were a kid, a company commander, no, or a no, platoon. No, I was 23. 20, that's what I'm saying. Were you considered to be a seasoned old man at that point in time yeah. by the men under your... I was the oldest person in, in my platoon in Paris Island. And when I got to Nam, I was actually 24 by then. And I was one of the oldest people in my rifle platoon. The only one older than me was, um, I think, one career Marine, Sergeant Falafini. He had been in the Marine Corps for a while, and he was the only one that was older than me. I think he was about 27. And the sad thing is he got killed. Yeah. And so all wars are children's wars. Yeah, isn't mm -hmm. that, yeah. I mean, the average age of a rifleman on Iwo Jima was like mm -hmm. 17 to 18. 18, 19. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It was just the oldest remarkable. person on, in the field was the, uh, CEO of the battalion, probably in his early 40s. Mm -hmm. That was it. He was the old and the, and the sergeant major. Yeah. You know, I, I interviewed uh, chopper pilots who were 22 years old, uh, who, you know, were talking about having an AK round go through their console through a camera, and they're saying, "Look, here it is. What a great war souvenir." Jesus. Uh, and not, never thinking that it could have been right up their rear end. Yeah. You know, in the first novel that I wrote, which has a serious Vietnam part of it, it's a World War II Vietnam story of a father and son. Uh, one of the persons who wrote a blurb, as we all have in the back of our books, was a Vietnam helicopter pilot. And he wrote the blurb, we should hate the war, but honor the warrior. And I like that yeah. distinction. And, how, you know, World War II, we saw the incoming heroes. They were treated with magnificent royalty. How are you gentlemen? Did you have any vivid experiences because of how you came home? We've heard so many stories and saw so many stories about the mistreatment of the returning. Why don't you just go you know, get Ron, would you with Ron. <laughs> Oh gosh, where to begin? Um, in terms of, uh, I guess you're saying, respect. In terms of respect, uh, I'm trying to, I have so many situations that I could pick on. <laughs> uh, first of all, um, leaving basic training, um, I was in Georgia at the time, Fort Gordon, Georgia. And uh, I was leaving, not basic, but advanced infantry training. And it was the first leave I was, uh, uh, had to come home. And it was like uh, I had two weeks before my going to Vietnam. Okay, and I, I'm coming through the airport in Atlanta. 
in a big hurry trying to find a flight to New York. And uh, the, 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 the people, this is again talking about regional re uh, reaction to the, uh, the war. In Georgia, I had people, uh, as I was running to a plane, because uh, one of the uh, workers there, as a matter of fact, uh, at the desk, when you come in to uh, get a, a ticket, told me there's a plane leaving to New York in five minutes. It's a gate so-and-so, which is like at the other side of the airport. Right? I'm going to call and have them hold up the plane. Right? I'm in uniform and everything else. And as I'm running through, I felt like, a, I don't know, an O.J. Simpson commercial. I'm running through the airport with double.